We're going to do the Ralph Waldo Emerson stuff today. I assume still most of you have heard of Ralph Waldo Emerson from inspirational posters, bumper stickers, greeting cards, refrigerator magnets, sort of anything that's this long and doesn't, you know, sort of doesn't do too much to um, shake the way you're living. But I want today to kind of try to put the fangs or the claws back on Emerson, so I'm going to try to um, kind of re-weird him for you if possible. We've talked over the last couple of weeks about uh, much, about religion in American history and also about politics in American history, sort of through the colonial period and up through 1776. And I mentioned that the revolution, sorry, the religion goes like this, right? The religious fervor sort of peaks and valleys through time. And we sort of speculated that politics sort of follows that course. It's not perfect, but you can kind of see some resonances, right? So we talked about Jonathan Edwards in 17, let's say 37 or so through 1740. Somewhere in there is called America's First Great Awakening. And it's kind of the um, attempt to kind of rekindle Puritanism a generation after the witch trials, right? So we saw that they kind of recoiled, they got interested in the Enlightenment, rationalism, those kinds of things after uh, the witch trials in Salem. And so for about 30 years, you know, you had this kind of this sort of cooling phase and then in this period, you get what's called America's First Great Awakening. And that movement focused on people in the churches who were kind of present, but not much more than that, right? So I sometimes, you know, just to jog your memory, I kind of joke that I love that, teaching that stuff. Because especially like in my 8 a.m. classes, I have students who are kind of, you know, there, but maybe not totally like bringing the fervor, right? So Jonathan Edwards is kind of trying to rekindle passion in church, trying to rekindle sort of energy. So he yells at him, we got some of that, but he's also sort of just very intense with his um, sermons and his essays. So we get then uh, another cooling period as we go through the um, revolutionary period. You get people like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and others who sort of identify as deists, Thomas Paine, which means they believe in God, but that's about all you can say about their religion. It doesn't go much further than that. And it sort of vaguely identifies with Christianity, but only kind of on the momentum of Western religion. Then we talked last time about how in, so we can call that like the, the sort of revolutionary period, 17, let's say 74 to 1790-ish or so. And of course there are exceptions to all of these dates, but as a rule, this is sort of a cooling period, both in terms of, you know, trust of um, political authority, but also religious authority. And then I think, not coincidentally, starting in about 1790, you see a resurgence of interest in, you know, trust in political institutions, but also rebuilding trust in religious institutions. So that takes a lot of different forms. But it's right when Emerson is born. This is kind of the environment he's born into, about 1803. His father was a Unitarian minister, which uh, I'll say more about in a minute. Unitarianism <coughs> is sort of different today than it might have been 200 years ago, but it's still represented, it always represented kind of the liberal wing of the Christian church. And uh, so we get right around this time what's called the Second Great Awakening, and I'll put very loose dates on it, something like 1790 to, you might even go all the way through 1844. And so in the middle of those years is where Emerson shows up and sort of contributes, right? And what happens there is I think he's going to define religion or redefine religion in such a manner that after Emerson, that is for us, after spring break. You, you can't not deal with, like, either you're reacting with Emerson or you're reacting against him, but you can't really not deal with Emerson. For a solid generation, and some would say for a hundred years or even into the present, if you want to do sort of serious public intellectual work or think about American religion. So those are the dates. You get in that period um, Emerson's nature, the essay that you read for today, which is 1836. And I will also mention things like uh, Mormonism, which kickstarts around 1832, Seventh Day Adventism, which kicks off in I think 1844 or so. So you get kind of a spawning of all sorts of you know different religious um, traditions. And the other thing I want to note about this Second Great Awakening is that unlike the first, it didn't focus on church members, people who were in church but not sort of doing it right. Instead, it focused on the unchurched masses in you know, the great frontier, sort of out west, places like southern Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, people who had kind of gone to grab a little <coughs> land out there, start a farm, but there were no churches out there, and it had been a generation or two since you know, they had been in, involved in Western Christianity. 
And so this movement, movement was kind of like a you know, traveling sales show for Christianity. They would bring a stage, set it up. In some cases, these outdoor meetings brought thousands of people, as many as 10,000 people would sort of meet on, you know, picture this, I picture like a Jimmy Buffett concert or some outdoor, <laughs> some, you know, on a hillside with a stage and people, I mean, there were no blockbuster movies, there was no Super Bowl, this was something to go to and it worked. It started bringing people from sort of western New York on down through, like I said, Kentucky or whatever, to these meetings. So during this time, Baptists, Methodists, and other sects made really severe, serious gains in the time in terms of church membership. And as I said, there are these sort of new, these new sects or new um, varieties of religion in American history. So let's see, although, as I said, that movement was sort of its hottest in places like Kentucky and Ohio, it certainly trickled back to places like New England or Boston very quickly so that people at Harvard Divinity School, for, for example, knew exactly what was going on. I think I should also mention, like, uh, just to give you a sense of how severe this got, in about 1843, 1844, there was one particularly interesting sect of Baptists called Millerites, who had done some, you know, calculation, reading the Bible where a year is worth a day, and et cetera. And they came out with the idea that, like, the, the second coming of Jesus is coming on, I'm going to get the date wrong, March 21st, 1844 and no later than that, right? So as that day approached, just to give you again a sense of how like, how much a kind of pitch of fervor was going on in American history, people started selling their stuff, again, quitting their jobs, acting like children, because it's only as little children that you get into the kingdom of heaven or whatever. Well, guess what? It didn't, it didn't end, right? 1844 wasn't the last day in history. But, you know, that gives you a sense of, and I think that's probably part of the reason you know, after that, maybe comparable to the witch trials, people started to go, well, okay, maybe we got a little carried away with the predictions of the sort of imminent return or whatever. But that is some of the um, religious background or the religious context. And of course, picture Ralph, little Ralph, 1803, sort of in the middle of all that, right? With his dad as a minister, he gets to um, Harvard College by the time he's, uh, I think, 14 years old. Um, and was raised, I guess that means like most of you probably in a Protestant Christian church, he was uh, training to be a minister just like his dad. It always makes me think of Cotton Mather. You can remember the Cotton Mather stuff we read earlier this semester, whose father was also an important minister, whose grandfather was a minister. So there's sort of high expectations on Emerson. And he graduates, you know, with honors, gets his own congregation at like one of the good churches, you know, I mean, the sort of the coveted positions in Boston. So he's kind of raring to go by the time he's probably your age or a little bit older than that. Uh, I should say a word about Unitarianism, I guess, I guess, or at least like historical Unitarianism, which um, these days is mostly only found in sort of major metropolitan areas. I think there's one Unitarian church in Charlotte not many more than that, there might be two, but maybe one in Asheville, maybe one in Raleigh, so not that prevalent a religion, but still out there. And it seems to me to be more, uh, uh, more or less, I don't, I don't know if you'd still put it in the Christian camp. I'm sort of not expert enough to talk. I think that they will sometimes talk about Jesus, but sometimes quote Buddha too, or Socrates, or sort of any number of other sort of prophet-like figures. Um, but at the time, it was certainly sort of firmly within the Christian tradition, but it would have emphasized this oneness stuff more than the Jesus stuff. In other words, just like deism, right? This is sort of the remnant of deism. So that's where Emerson's coming from. Uh, it was, at the time, the most sort of liberal sect of Christianity practiced in America. He, like I said, got a congregation uh, was doing fine, it seemed, probably having quite an impact for a young man in the city of Boston, in and around Boston, and then um, came to this crossroads where his congregation demanded that he administer the Eucharist or the communion, and he sort of said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't think it's important. I'm going to read you why. I think it's an interesting argument why. And of course, by the way, I mean, if your minister said that, would, would some of you worry? 
communion is practiced very differently in different sects of Christianity, but those who practice it feel like it matters. We should keep it. If the minister wants to stop, you go, hey, we want that, right? So this became a controversy right away, and I'm going to read you, uh, this is from Emerson's 1834 essay um, called The Lord's Supper, where he sort of explains himself anymore, and I'm just going to read you kind of the central paragraph there. It's not in your book, so I'd ask you to read along. So he, he says, Still, we must suppose that the expression, this do in remembrance of me, which of course is a reference to Jesus on the night of the Last Supper, breaking the bread, passing the wine around, saying, you know, sort of do this in remembrance of me, that this expression had come to the ear of Luke from some disciple who was present. What did it really signify? It is a prophetic and an affectionate expression. He means, um, uh, yeah, so Jesus, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt myself. Jesus is a Jew sitting there with his countrymen, celebrating their national feast. He thinks of his own impending death and wishes the minds of his disciples to be prepared for it. When hereafter, he says to them, now of course Emerson's like liberally paraphrasing what Jesus said that night. You shall keep the Passover. It will have an altered aspect in your eyes. It is now a historical covenant of God with the Jewish nation. Hereafter it will remind you of a new covenant sealed with my blood. In years to come, as long as your people shall come up to Jerusalem to keep this feast, the connection which has subsisted between us will give a new meaning in your eyes to the national festival as the anniversary of my death. I see natural feeling and beauty in the use, that's the end of the quote, sorry. Then Emerson says, I see natural feeling and beauty in the use of such language from Jesus, a friend to his friends. I can readily imagine that he was willing and desirous when his disciples met, his memory should hallow or make sacred their intercourse. But I cannot bring myself to believe that in the use of such an expression, he looked beyond the living generation, beyond the abolition of the festival he was celebrating, and the scattering of the nation, and meant to impose a memorial feast upon the whole world. I know that's kind of a mouthful, but the gist of it is like, if somehow I knew I'm about to die, or be arrested and maybe die, I might say to my friends, hey, when I'm gone, have a toast to me, right, once a year or something on the date. Emerson thinks that's all it was, just like, hey guys, remember me when I'm gone. Not an attempt to establish something like a ritual that would last 2,000 years, right? So, I mean, I think that that, like, that sort of, that break with his own church, and by the way, they kicked him out at that point. Like, <laughs> interesting essay, but not good enough, give us the communion, right? So I think when that happens, Emerson doesn't intend at all to stop preaching. He just can't find a congregation at churches on Sundays. So now he's, you know, he's going to preach from lecture podiums instead of pulpits. But it's still Emerson, and he's still a preacher, I think. And I think that's the best way to understand what he's doing here. He's going to kind of st strip all the, uh, like the essential Christian language out of his teaching. But he's going to try to keep or retain the, the gist somehow, the spirit of it, right? So when Emerson talks about personal transformation, it should sound very much like when Jonathan Edwards talks about personal transformation, except he's going to pull out all the religious language from it. Okay, so that's the religious background. I'll give you a little bit more sense of the politics. Um, we talked a lot last week about the revolutionary period, 1776, when the revolution is won, through about 1788 to 1790, when the Constitution is ratified and goes into effect. Um, it's also, anybody heard of the Madison versus Marbury case? You might even know those names, even if you can't remember what it is. I won't go too deeply into it other than to note that that's 1803, which is only 13 years really since the Constitution has started. And uh, it's almost an essential change to the structure of the US government. Like this is about who can appoint, you know, uh, like basically who has executive powers, who has whether one president's powers transfer to the next, et cetera. Major, major reconfiguration. So I hope it gives you a sense of how like unstable things felt from 1790 to 1803, if you can kind of pull the rug out from your own government only 13 years into making it. Uh, and then 1812 to 1815, when Emerson's, you know, just knee high or so, uh, America was f fighting with Britain again, mostly this time because Britain was conscripting or forcing American soldiers into 
the British Army essentially in their war against France, which you can imagine would make the American people and the president upset. And so uh, they fight off the British again, and this time declare kind of in response the Monroe Doctrine, which states that U.S. powers won't intervene in European affairs and, and should be vice versa, right? So we're going to be kind of a hands-off place. I hope that this feels relevant to our conversation about like what is an American that we kind of you know going back a couple of weeks is America going to be the kind of place that goes out and you know seeks to kind of police the world or are we going to kind of you know stay in insular and take care of um, domestic stuff? You might say that the Monroe Doctrine sort of is the implicit uh, doctrine through arguably, I don't know, it depends on when. First World War, I guess we're involved in European stuff, Second World War again. Certainly by the time of Bush, where you get what's called the Bush Doctrine, unofficially, where he says, like, if there's a problem anywhere, we'll go get it, nip it in the bud over there, right? That's a different stance than you have here. And I think you can see that the, these definitions have been in flux since this time, but they were very sort of unstable, middle, early middle of the 19th century. In 1837, you get what's called the Panic of, <laughs> guess, 1837, which um, I, I reminded me a lot of the 2008 sort of disaster, the economic disaster. I know it maybe didn't hit you guys firsthand, but some of you would have heard from your parents about how difficult a time that was. We were having, you know, we were graduating students that were having a harder time than ever finding work. So this was sort of a real thing. Uh, in 2008, when that happens, it might mean you have to like, you know, I don't know, find a less desirable job, cut your Netflix subscription, whatever. In 1837, it's like outright panic in some cases. Um, like the 2008 uh, disaster, it was sort of built on this kind of speculative investing fever, and then, you know, the bubble burst, and now nobody's as rich as they thought they were. Difficult times. Banks stopped paying specie, you know, sort of exchanging gold for money, people, that sort of sets off um, panic. What followed was a five-year depression. Um, high unemployment levels, banks failing. Um, the, let's see, the incoming president had been in office for five weeks at the time when this sort of disaster struck, and of course he got blamed for it, so I don't know if that's fair or not, but that was Van Buren, Van, Martin Van Buren. And then from 1829 to 1837, Andrew Jackson was president. Jackson's Whig Party replaced the, or sorry, Jackson's Democrat Party replaced the Whig Party, and uh, their main purpose was to widen political participation. So before about 1829 or somewhere in there, you had to be male, you had to be white, you had to be a landowner, you know, essentially, to vote. And they're, they're going to try to sort of widen the, um, the sort of qualification, right, so that more people can participate in the electoral process. Uh, he also, let's see, well, so that's enough about Jackson. That's, that's sort of the politics. And my hope with all that is just to give you a context that things are, things are chaotic, right? There, and by the way, there are predictions of the end of the world and, you know, all kinds of sort of things things shaking. Let me give you one more specific story just to kind of reinforce that narrative. In 1831, anybody heard of Nat Turner? Nat Turner's Rebellion? I'm going to tell you the story because it almost, I like sometimes nervous giggle laugh when I tell it because it's so, uh, it's so urgent a story and so kind of tragic from every perspective. I'm just going to read a little narrative that I have here in my notes. So, uh, Nat Turner with a few trusted fellow slaves um, started an insurgency that ultimately numbered more than 70 enslaved and free blacks, some of whom were on horseback. On August 13, 1831, there was an atmospheric disturbance which made the sun appear bluish green. Turner took this as the final signal, and a week later, on August 21st, the rebellion began. The rebels traveled from house to house, freeing slaves and killing all the white people they found. Because the rebels did not want to alert um, anyone of their presence as they carried out their attacks, they used knives, hatchets, axes, and blunt instruments instead of firearms. One historian states that Turner called on his group to, quote, kill all the white people. Another historian quoting the Richmond Enquirer writes that, quote, Turner declared that indiscriminate slaughter was not their intention after they attained a foothold, 
and was resorted to in the first instance to strike terror and alarm. However, they spared a few homes because Turner believed the poor white inhabitants thought no better of themselves than they did of Negroes." End quote. The rebellion spared almost no one. There was one little child who had hid in a fireplace that survived, but I mean, bloody disaster all over the place. Uh, approximately 60 white men, women, and children were killed before Turner and his brigade of insurgents were defeated by a white militia twice its size, reinforced by three companies of artillery. Like, that is a, can you imagine? I mean, man, what a, so as fast as possible, of course, this is front page news for weeks. And so this just, I sort of give you this story so that you get a sense that like when people say, ah, everything's crazy these days, so that you understand that like it's been that crazy at other times in the past, right? This was, must have sort of freaked people out. And before 1831, by the way, it was almost possible as an American, especially if, if you lived in the North, to kind of not have an opinion about slavery, to kind of feel like, I ah, mind in my own business or something. After 1831, no way. Everybody has to take a corner, right? You have to have an opinion about it and you have to kind of know what you're talking about and sort of, I think that really kind of kickstarts the movement that turns into abolitionism. So that's that. Into all that uh, chaos, Emerson shows up and I think that probably the um, optimal response to Emersonianism is, you know, some of you will have Walt Whitman, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Whitman, you know, great poet, Thoreau moves out to the woods in some weird hippie experiment. <laughs> Margaret Fuller starts like kind of an awesome book club in Boston. So this is like, he really is sort of the, you know, the fountainhead of a lot of intellectual stuff in America at the time. But I want to note, just to keep the weird factor up high on Emerson, there were also sort of disaster disciples. In other words, people who maybe, I don't know, took it too seriously or got, I don't know what exactly is happening here. Or maybe, more interestingly, caught some kind of a vision, right? Like, remember when Jonathan Edwards talked about getting saved, he talked about a change in perception, right? A change in, like, how you experience the world or how you see the world. I think in the case of Jones Very, we have something like that. I'm going to read this to you because I think it's so interesting. This is quoted from Bronson Alcott, who was himself a kind of um, Boston uh, intellectual of the day. So in 1838, one of Emerson's students who was about, I think, 23, 24 at the time and had been working under Emerson at Harvard, sort of teaching Greek to undergraduates. So he might be 24, but he's teaching, you know, 18 to 20 year olds teaching Greek. Uh, he, something happened in 1838 where he went to these Emerson lectures, read Nature closely, heard Emerson's essay on self-reliance, and got really into it, and maybe even too into it. Uh, for instance, apparently, rumor has it, one day showed up to teach his class, uh, declaring himself to be the second coming of Christ, the end times were at hand, run for the mountains, this is it, right? What do we do with those people? we will put them away, right? And we did. He went to a mental institution for a month or so. But I think it's interesting to note that after that, he actually did just kind of recover and melt back into regular society. He was a apparently mediocre regular teacher for the rest of his days, wrote some average poetry. I don't mean to trash him, but it's, <laughs> it's not that great. Bronson Alcott says this of that sort of weird incident. He says, I received a letter on Monday of this week from Jones Very of Salem, formerly tutor in Greek at Harvard College, which institution he left a few weeks since, being deemed insane by the faculty. A few weeks ago, he visited me. He is a remarkable man. His influence at Cambridge on the best young men was very fine. His talents are of a high order. Is he insane? If so, there yet linger glimpses of wisdom in his memory. He is insane with God, diswitted in the contemplation of the holiness of divinity. He distrusts intellect, living, not thinking, he regards as the worship meet for the soul. This is mysticism in its highest form. That's weird, right? Is that weird? I hope that sounds weird to you. 
that's Emerson's effect too. So you have on the one hand people like Thoreau and Whitman who we kind of congratulate for doing something interesting as a result, but we also have Jones Very who reads Emerson and goes kind of haywire it seems, right? So keep that in your mind because I, like I said I'm trying to kind of reclaim the strangeness of Emerson. So Emerson's credited in America with kind of kick-starting the transcendentalist movement. That's what we're going to call this for the rest of the semester. Um, they always are careful about their language. They use words like the universal oversoul, and sometimes they'll capitalize the U and the O. There's, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the great creator deity with capital G, whatever, yeah. Uh, but that, um, he says, th here's what it does, regardless of what we call it, that thing, that universal oversoul connects all of humanity and it does not recognize conventional markers of identity like national identity, race, gender, religious affiliation, etc. Right? In other words, this thing, this thing he's talking about that maybe freaked Jones very out, it is perfectly democratic. And I think I want you to pay some close attention to that, right? That in Emerson's oversoul, you have something that sees through the apparent differences and might be a unifying force for everybody, really everybody. So what does it do? It sort of, if you can, um, I guess the best way to do this is to go back to Jonathan Edwards. It sort of somehow changes our perception or our experience of reality. It says this was quite literally learning to see differently or correctly, truly, for the first time. And that becomes the aim of these transcendentalists. I know that's a weird idea, but it's, you know, he, look, turn to your books now, if you have them. Let me read to you the stuff on page 508. And I think this will help us to kind of at least understand the claim of this slide. How can that be? See correctly, what does that mean? I've been seeing things my whole life, and it seems like I'm getting an ac accurate perception of them. So on page 508, I want to start by noting the um, quote from Plotinus at the beginning, which itself is a weird source. Um, most of the people in Emerson's day would have been quoting people like Plato, Aristotle, maybe John Locke. They're quoting sort of rationalists, basically. But what you have with Plotinus is this almost unique, esoteric, third or fourth century Greek post-Christian, pagan, what is he, philosopher, mystic, he's none of those things exactly, but he's a really weird bird. So to put this over your sort of seminal essay on, you know, thought, is it's, a, it's sort of waving a freak flag, right? Like this is going to be unusual, basically, and, it, and what follows is. So read the first half of that. We don't even have to read the first quote before, uh, we're going to have to almost like scratch our heads. He says, Plotinus says, nature is but an image or imitation of wisdom. Nature is but an image or imitation of wisdom. Nature is but an image or imitation of wisdom. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but having read all of Emerson, I think I know. I think I have a sense. Maybe after all this, I'll ask you. My sense, though, is that what he's talking about here is that you can, you can like, nature is the teacher. The world is the teacher. Any questions you have about who I am, why I'm here, what this all means, can be answered by studying the world, right? In the Christian tradition, they might say, you can know the creator by studying the creation. It's sort of that idea, but it's going to get a lot weirder with Emerson. All right, so read that first paragraph, this very famous first paragraph of um, the introduction of nature. He says, our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchers of the father, the, the sepulchers of the fathers. Sepulchers are tombs, you know, burial places. And uh, what is retrospective? Like, literally kind of backwards looking, right? So we live in a time that's backwards looking. We worry about building monuments to dead people. Keep reading. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We, through their eyes. I'll pause there to draw my favorite cartoon of the semester, which is, you know, basically in the old days, Emerson says, God and people had this kind of a relationship, right? Where it's just, basically, it's just direct. It's kind of, um, think Joan of Arc or Moses or anybody who sort of has direct revelation. Even the disciples of Jesus have a kind of direct 
intercourse or you know sort of uh, interaction with divinity in that way, right? But Emerson says we're like this. We're like back here playing a game of telephone, kind of obviously with a more neutral or somber aspect on our faces, and we only get secondhand relayed information. It goes through many generations sometimes, right? So you might feel, if you don't feel like you've had the same kind of prophetic experience of Moses or the prophets or something like that, that you know, what you know about God comes like this, secondhand. Emerson's had it with that, and what he wants is this. He wants it to be direct or not at all. So that's what we're going for. That's kind of the goal. I want to know God now, today, and not filtered through all the ritual. At the end of that paragraph, he says, The sun shines today also. There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. Then he gets optimistic, characteristically optimistic, for, at least for early Emerson. He says, Undoubtedly, we have no questions to ask which are unanswerable. We must trust the perfection of the creation so far as to believe that whatever curiosity the order of things has awakened in our minds, the order of things can satisfy. Every man's condition is a solution in hieroglyphic to those inquiries he would put. He acts it as life before he apprehends it as truth. Hieroglyphics, we can start with that. What's hieroglyphics? Egyptian pictographs, right? And some of you might have heard of the Rosetta Stone, if only because of the recent commercial, the whatever that is, the language acquisition thing, right? It's this tablet that was recovered in, I think, 1799 somewhere that had, it's got this sort of funny broken shape to it where it, it's broken into three sections where I think it has Greek, something else, and some Egyptian hieroglyphs on it. And it took, uh, it took the scholars something like a whole generation to kind of crack the code, even having that. But I think by about 1822, they released the first kind of first draft of a translation of the Rosetta Stone. And then over the next 10 years or so, leading up to when Emerson's talking, like this is a reference that everybody knows. We're, because previously you had gone, you know, people had gone to the pyramids or gone into the crypts and they had seen this stuff and clearly it's something, right? It's too, it's too intricate and too ornate to just be like decoration. They could tell there were repeating patterns, they just couldn't get their hooks into it anywhere. Starting with the Rosetta Stone, they start to be able to decode it. Okay? So for Emerson to call nature that is a really interesting, sort of both historical but also philosophical way of thinking about what the world is. The world is a hieroglyph. You might not have known that before today, but congratulations, I'm telling you, now the learning process can start, right? What Emerson's going to say is that all you have to do now is learn to read it, learn to decode it, right? You've, sure, you've seen trees and grass and so on before, but you didn't, you didn't even know you were supposed to read them. You didn't realize they were symbols for something higher, right? And this is the real teacher, Emerson's going to suggest, that the world is out there to sort of tell us what's real, what's true. Keep reading there. He says, in like manner, Nature is already, in its form and tendencies, describing its own design. Let us interrogate the great apparition, the great ghost, that shines so peacefully around us. Let us inquire, to what end is nature? What a weird question. To what end is nature means something like, why is there anything? Why is this all here? We don't usually ask that, do we? Like, why does something exist? But Emerson wants to ask the question, and he thinks he has an answer. And the answer is something like, because it's a schoolroom. It's how you're going to learn. It's how we come to know divinity, basically. So that's what this change in seeing would be. You would start to understand that things are only what they appear to be superficially. What they really are is, it takes decoding. It takes a special kind of looking. As I said, we can process this by thinking back through Emerson's church history a little bit, even thinking back to Jonathan Edwards. In Christianity, the sort of end game or the whole point of it is to get saved, right? It's salvation. It's that, to get with it. Um, and it requires, say, some theologians, something like an inward change or a rebirth or being born again, etc. And I think that Emerson has 
Like, no lower expectation than that. This has to be that dramatic of a process or else you're not getting the real thing. But he's not going to call, he's sort of dispensing with the religious terminology. But I think he's keeping this idea of like a, a sacred moment of inner or um, spiritual change. That's a hokey way of um, giving you a sense of what it might be like to start to perceive like this. All my slides up until now have been black and white. Um, now they're in color. But you didn't probably notice they were in black and white because, you know, they're in black and white. You just take it for granted, right? Until I show you a slide that's in color and then you go, oh, okay, color. I mean, it doesn't blow you away because it's a silly, you know, analogy. But what Emerson's sort of suggesting is that, again, yes, you've seen things, but you haven't seen them the right way. You haven't noticed what they really are and what they kind of aren't and so on, right? So things have changed in your perception now that I call something to your attention like that. And that's loosely, I think, the kind of change that, um, that, that Emerson is interested in. If you have your notebooks out, this is a good picture to draw the, um, and sort of the, the easiest way to sort of sum up everything Emerson thinks, or at least the challenge that he poses to American intellectual or public life is in this chart. He talks about the me or the self or the I in the middle and everything that isn't that outside of it. Other people, my body, art, you can read that definition uh, in the second paragraph on page 809 where he says, philosophically considered, the universe is composed of nature and the soul. Strictly speaking, therefore, all that is separate from us, all which philosophy distinguishes as the not me, that is both nature and art, all other men in my own body, must be ranked under this name, nature. Emerson does distinguish a little bit between like capital N nature, which is everything that's not the self, and lowercase n nature, which means like the green stuff, the outdoors, okay? Again, kind of a hokey animation, but watch this. You can see that, I'm going to borrow a term from like high school biology, that the, there, there appears to be a barrier here between me and not me, but Emerson argues that it's a semi-permeable membrane and that there is a kind of leakage that happens back and forth between me and the world and that some communication can ultimately happen. It's not easy, but you can kind of do that. And if you really sort of study the boundaries, by the way, you can kind of feel that, right? If we if I ask you where your self is, this is going to be some real weird stuff, but like some people will picture it in the head. Some people will say they feel like this is the core in their heart somewhere, but very few people will say like my kneecap is where my self, my deepest self is, right? So we have a sense that it's in our body, but we also feel like, you know, if I l l lose an arm in a car crash or something, I don't think of myself as 85% me. So we have a kind of dualism, right? We sense that the real me isn't my body exactly. So Emerson's really kind of encouraging us to look into that zone. Inside the world is a self, inside the self is a world, etc. That's sort of um, how Emerson wants to picture that. So I'm going to um, point you to page 5. 10 in your books where there is that picture. I'm not going to try to get back to it on the slideshow, but there is that picture of the walking eyeball. And I want to sort of conclude by saying that some people almost right away and all the way through now will make fun of Emerson for being like kind of head in the clouds, kind of too abstract, new agey, sound and fury, but n not signifying a lot, right? The picture there is from Christopher Cranch who draws a picture of a transparent eyeball. I'm going to read you that section on 511. So Emerson's trying to describe this holy moment of conversion, transformation, inner change. He says, Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. That is some wacky talk and also really fun. And usually what happens to me when I read Emerson is I get a three-day boost of like, Ooh, everything is meaningful and awesome, and then like I read Poe and it feels like that was kind of all a bunch of no nonsense. So I'm going to um, sort of sum this up with my quote from... Um, 
Let me see if I, if I can find it here. I thought I had a good one from um, William James. Who, um, William James, about a generation after Emerson, sort of 15 or 20 years after Emerson died, um, doing a study of American public religious life, goes back to Emerson as the moment where this kind of schism in American public thought started, where on the one hand you have kind of traditionalists who want to honor ritual, stick to it, you know, do it the old-fashioned way, and on the other hand you have people who kind of feel that they can dispense with orthodoxy, doctrine, ritual, etc. And obviously those are sort of the Emersonians. Here it is, the one little paragraph. He says, Ritual worship in general appears to the modern transcendentalist as well as to the ultra-puritanic type of mind as if addressed to a deity of an almost absurdly childish character, taking delight in toy shop furniture, tapers and tinsel, costume and mumbling and mummery, and finding his glory incomprehensibly enhanced thereby. Just as on the other hand, the formless spaciousness of pantheism appears quite empty to ritualistic natures, and the gaunt theism of evangelical sects seems intolerably bald and chalky and bleak. Luther, Martin Luther, says Emerson, would have cut off his right hand rather than nail his theses to the door at Wittenberg if he had supposed that they were destined to lead to the pale negations of Boston Unitarianism. <laughs> That's saying a lot, and I know it's sort of housed in this kind of you know, Christian tradition stuff, but he's basically saying that Luther, Luther kick-starting the Protestant Reformation, would have never done it if he thought that what it would end up leading to was Emerson. Emerson's aware of that and is still doing Emerson. And I gotta give him some credit, at least for courage, right? That he goes through with it. He's had a major influence ever since. I think even up to now, most public intellectuals in America will sort of go through an Emerson phase or else rebel and reject it. <laughs>